The reading today uh, from Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 to 30. Um, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me, and I will trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death, But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honour such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Welcome. If this is your first time with us or if you're just visiting this morning, there we go. Now you can hear me in 3D. Um, uh, Really great to have you with us this morning. My name's Johnny. I'm the pastor and part of the leadership team here at Hebron. It is really great to have you with us, whether you're new um, or or just visiting or you've been around lots before. Um, Now we are um, going to be continuing our series in um, Philippians, uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 to 30. have just been read for us very helpfully. Thank you to Chris for that. It would be helpful uh, to me and I trust to you to have that open over the next few minutes. If you do have a Bible with you or have access to one on on a phone or device, please do have that open if you can. And before we think about it together, though, I'm going to, to, I'm actually going to borrow some of Paul's words from Philippians uh, and to pray for us. Let me lead us in prayer. Paul writes, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Our God and Father, we pray too that we, through studying your word together over the next few minutes, we grow to abound, abound in love, with knowledge and with all discernment. And we ask it all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Well, um, music tribute acts are big business in the world of entertainment. Uh, You may have come across tribute acts playing at a wedding before um, or a function of some kind. And uh, to be honest, some tribute acts are worth hiring uh, just for the dreadful puns alone. Uh, In a very quick Google search this week, I found acts uh, ranging from Fake That uh, to Oasis and uh, non-Jovi to the Rolling Clones, and even for a certain vintage among us, Phony M. And uh, though the names might suggest they're joke acts, many of them really aren't. Tribute acts and tribute music is a serious industry in its own right. Musicians travel all over the world to perform as a clone of the original artist. In fact, some tribute acts have been so successful that they've actually led other people to copy them. Uh, One example, a group formed in Australia in the 1990s, they were an ABBA tribute act called Bjorn Again, and the group quickly established themselves as talented artists in their own right, so much so that other folks cottoned on to how good they were, and uh, so Bjorn Again have themselves spawned multiple other Bjorn Agains, who are not just copies, but who are effectively copies of copies. And that is just what we are going to be called to be today. To become copies of copies. Not copies, you'll be glad to hear, of Swedish singing groups. But copies of copies of the Apostle Paul. Now, if this is your your first time with us, um, we are well underway in a series in the letter to the Philippians... And we've identified that one of the key themes in this letter is the idea that Christians are gospel partners with one another. 
We are fellow workers together in the task of telling other people about Jesus and helping each other to grow in our love for him. And we've established that the Philippians were a really good bunch to write to about gospel partnership because they were doing really well on that front. And yet, as we're going to see over the weeks to come, they really weren't immune from problems. And so Paul, the author of this letter, is writing to them, at least in part, to try and help them to split-proof their partnership, to keep them together. And one way they can do that, says Paul, one way they can protect themselves from coming apart at the seams is by becoming copycats. Copycats, firstly, of Jesus. That one might be expected, I guess. Two weeks ago, we were encouraged, exhorted even, to share the same humble, other person-centered mindset towards people as Jesus. Copycat, secondly, though, of the Apostle Paul. And that was a tad more surprising for some of us, I think. You might remember me asking, if you were here, how you fancied modeling your life on the life of the Apostle Paul. But copycats, thirdly, this morning, of other copycats. What do I mean? Well, in Philippians chapter 2, Paul paints two pen portraits, two mini biographies, if you like, of two different men. One of a man called Timothy, and another of a man called Epaphroditus. And as a general principle, we aren't meant to copy everyone we meet in the Bible. Okay, so the Bible's actually a story about lots of imperfect people and about one perfect one. So we shouldn't make a habit of trying to emulate everyone we read about in the Bible. But in this instance, we are meant to copy these two men. Because in chapter 3, which we'll look at in a couple of weeks' time, Paul tells us to do just that. If you have a Bible open in front of you, look on to chapter 3, verse 17 with me. Paul writes this, brothers, join in imitating me, that is Paul, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Or in other words, there are certain people, people like Timothy and Epaphroditus, as we'll see this morning, who are copying Paul. So, says Paul, copy them too. Be copiers of copiers. And so we're going to spend our morning looking at these two pen portraits of Timothy and Epaphroditus and effectively holding them up as mirrors, asking ourselves, how much do I look like Timothy? How much do I look like Epaphroditus? We're going to begin that with the first of those two pen portraits in verses 19 to 24, which I've given the heading by me. Oh, the heading's already up. Wonderful. Be like Timothy prioritize Jesus and therefore others' interests. Now, I wonder if you've ever seen a police photo fit before, when the police are given a a verbal description of a suspect by a witness to a crime, and they're trying to track down the criminal. They sometimes employ an artist to draw a picture based on that verbal description. They use them quite a lot on TV shows like Crime Watch. I think, I'm not sure if Crime Watch is still on, but, but that's my generation, I guess. Occasionally, though, you would see hilarious attempts at police photo fits in the press, pictures of people that looked like nothing, nothing like any human being who's ever walked the face of the earth. But in Timothy, we have a very realistic photo fit indeed. See, I'm aware that some of us might need convincing that we're meant to emulate Timothy and Epaphroditus this morning, because from reading these verses at first glance, they just look like travel plans, don't they? They look quite mundane, in fact. But if you do still need convincing... Just clock the very accurate photo fit we have of Timothy in verses 19 to 24, because it is a picture of a description we've already been given in Philippians. What do I mean? Well, a couple of weeks ago, we were in the beginning of Philippians chapter 2, in chapter 2, verse 4, we read this. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now let me read verse 20 again and see if it rings any bells. For I have no one like Timothy who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, 
not those of Jesus Christ. Timothy is a photo fit of exactly the kind of person Paul's describing in Philippians 2. See, he's a walking, talking example of what Paul wants the Philippians to be like. And so the big message from verses 19 to 24, which, which might look like a note of some travel plans, it is, in fact, be like Timothy. All of which begs the question, in what way? What is it about Timothy that's particularly worth emulating? Because, again, on the face of it, Paul seems to be a bit confused about what it is that motivates Timothy. I wonder if you spotted that. In verse 20, we read that, that, that Paul has no one like Timothy, no one who is genuinely concerned for the Philippians' welfare. And so to hammer that point home, what we're then expecting him to say in the next verse, in verse 21, is something like, for they all seek their own interests, not those of other people. Or, or perhaps instead, for they all seek their own interests, not those of the good folks of Philippi. But that isn't what he says, is it? No, verse 20, Paul doesn't know anyone who's so concerned for the Philippians. Verse 21, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Now, can you see what Paul's saying? He's saying that being concerned for Jesus' interests is the same thing as being concerned for the Christians in Philippi. Being concerned about the Christians in Philippi is the same thing as being concerned for Jesus' interests. He's conflating the two things. And that is a bit of a surprise, I think. It isn't how we often think of things. Because you see, Jesus himself is, is a very compelling figure, isn't he? But the church, Christians, well, we can be far less compelling. I remember being at a Christian festival a few years ago, getting into a chat with someone. I hadn't ever met him before. Things got very deep very quickly. And we were talking a bit about the landscape of church and of the Christian faith in Scotland as a whole, and particularly batting backwards and forwards the idea that Scotland is now a post-Christian culture. And he said he didn't think we were living in a post-Christian culture, as lots of people seem to suggest, because, you see, Jesus is still quite popular on the whole. People still quote him in public life from time to time. People still like the idea of Jesus. He's still quite attractive to people in our culture. So we can't say we're post-Christian, he said. No, we are living, he said, in a post-church culture. A post-organized religion culture. And um, from his point of view, that wasn't a bad thing at all. Because the church gets stuff wrong so much of the time. If anything, it's really quite a good thing that the church was on the wane in his view. They were just getting out of the way. And you might well have some sympathy for that view. I think I probably did at the time too, actually. Didn't really have much of a problem identifying myself with Jesus. He was an attractive figure. He was my rescuer. I had much more of a problem, though, identifying myself with Jesus' people, with the church. And it is worth being honest that the global church hasn't always represented Jesus' interests very well. The local churches don't always do it very well. But it's also worth being mindful that that isn't a new thing. It wasn't as though the first century churches that Paul was writing to was dealing with day by day, that, that they were getting everything right every step of the way. When you read through the New Testament, some of the churches Paul was writing to were absolute basket cases. And yet, Paul can still say that if I want to prioritize the interests of Jesus in my life, like Timothy did, well, one way that's going to cash out is in me prioritizing the interests of my brothers and sisters, of my church family. And it is important we hear that this morning, I think, because there is an alternative to being like Timothy. There was an alternative in, in, in Paul's day, actually, and if anything, that alternative was probably more common than being like Timothy. Paul says, verse 20, he has no one like Timothy. Why? Verse 21, for they all seek their own interests. 
The inference is that it's just possible to claim to have Jesus' interests at heart, to want to honor him first. But rather than that cashing out in a love for his people, it cashing out in you still seeking your own interests. What might that look like? Well, we touched on that a couple of weeks ago. It might look like using the local church as a place to get ahead, to earn kudos amongst other people perhaps to build your own kind of legacy for yourself. One other way it might cash out, though, perhaps in a more subtle way, is in treating church as a commodity, an experience that meets your spiritual needs, an event even that you come to each week. Rather than thinking of church as as people, people for whom you are, to use Paul's words, genuinely concerned. Now, we are at a time of year where where I know that quite a few folks are arriving in this city and are looking around different churches to see where they might settle. If that is you, you you're very, very welcome this morning. Please don't worry. This isn't time for me to make a big plug for you sticking with us here in Hebron, but I am going to make a plug, more than a plug, in fact, for taking church seriously. I was at a conference a few weeks ago with a number of other pastors One of the guys there told me about a lady who'd lived in his city for literally years. She was a very clear Christian. She occasionally popped up in his church on a Sunday morning. He got to to chatting with her, and it had transpired that she never went to the same church two weeks in a row. Just never did it. And uh, one of the reasons she wouldn't settle, she wouldn't go somewhere consecutive weeks, was that she couldn't find a church that ticked every box for her, she said. Each of them were really good at one thing or another. Some were good with the music, and and some were good with the the preaching and teaching. Some were great in their community aspect, but none of them were the full package, she said. And so she basically thought that the mature thing for her to do as a Christian, the way to remain really faithful to Jesus, was just to hop around different places each week, to get a flavor of each one. Now, that is a really easy thing to do in a city, Perhaps not every week, but just to jump around quite a lot, different churches. And even to think that that's the way we really honor Jesus, because those people over there, they just aren't honoring him like I am. Now, please don't mishear me. There are genuine reasons to leave a local church family, and Paul isn't arguing for unity at any cost. We'll see that next week and into the following weeks. Truth really matters to Paul. But at the same time, If you do really want to prioritize Jesus' interests, really keen to follow him, well, one way to do that, says Paul, is to be genuinely concerned for real-life people. Not for church as an idea or church as an event, but church as your gospel partners whom you love and who love you. Be like Timothy, says Paul. Prioritize Jesus and therefore others' interests ahead of your own. Now, I do wonder whether some of you might right now be thinking that I'm hamming all of that up a bit too much. Preachers can do that, can't we? You might have been thinking that for a few Sundays, in fact. We're a few weeks into the series by now. And each week, Kevin or or, or Willie or I have, have, have really been fairly strong on this idea of gospel partnership of serving Jesus alongside other Christians, side by side, as one. But you might well be getting a bit fed up of it by now, and even starting to to think that I'm making a bit of a mountain out of a molehill, making more of a, a big issue of gospel partnership than the Bible would. And I can't see why you might think that, but I really don't think I am. At least, I don't think I'm taking gospel partnership any more seriously than God does. Case in point, pen portrait number two. We'll look at that under our second heading this morning. Be like Epaphroditus, risking his life for the sake of God's people, verses 25 to 30. Now, there are few countries in the world who honor service men and service women better than our American brethren. They do the, the honor thing with, with great gusto. If you're injured during a conflict with an enemy of the U.S., for example, you're awarded a Purple Heart. And over one million Purple Hearts were awarded after the Second World War, apparently. And the 7th of August each year is National Purple Heart Day. 
uh, where people are called to remember those who've been in, injured in action. Uh, for good or for ill, some countries are a bit more low-key than that in how they honor um, folks. We would probably be more low-key uh, than the States, certainly. But I think Paul would be very much in favor of National Purple Heart Day, of honoring people who've been injured in action. Uh, not military action, don't mishear me, but in gospel action. See, I wonder if you picked up as we read this second pen portrait that, that this second individual, Epaphroditus, had a very tough time. We read in verses 26 and 27 that he was really unwell. So unwell, in fact, that it looked like he might not make it. Paul says that he was near to death. And that was a really upsetting thing for Epaphroditus, as you might understand. But not for the reasons you might expect. Read with me again, verse 26. Epaphroditus has been longing for you all, and he has been distressed. Why? Because you heard that he was ill. Not because he was ill, but because you heard that he was ill. See, Epaphroditus wasn't upset because he was anxious about his own life but because he knew that the Philippians had picked up that he was unwell, seriously unwell, and he was anxious that they were worrying about him. Now, in one sense, that might paint Epaphroditus as being quite a thoughtful kind of guy, but I don't think thoughtfulness is really the mark we're meant to pick up on. I think what we're meant to pick up on is a mark of quite how committed he was to his partners in the gospel. And the reason I think that is because we're told what made him quite so unwell in the first place. Read on with me to verse 29. So receive Epaphroditus in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. See, it isn't an exaggeration to say that Epaphroditus just about worked himself to death for the sake of the Philippians, for the sake of Paul, and ultimately for the sake of Jesus. Now, we don't know for sure what his illness or his difficulty was. Paul doesn't give us that information in this letter. But we do know what kind of work he was doing. We read on into to chapter 4. We find that Epaphroditus was working as a courier. Chapter 4, verse 18. I am well supplied, writes Paul, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. He carried gifts from the Philippians to Paul. Just remember that in the ancient world, in order to get money or supplies from a place like Philippi to, to, to somewhere like Rome, a long, long way away, you couldn't make a bank transfer, you couldn't arrange a Tesco delivery, you had to take it yourself. And that's just what Epaphroditus did. And so the picture we have of Epaphroditus is of someone who is so committed to the Philippians' welfare that he's distressed that they might be upset who's so committed to Paul's welfare as one of his partners in the gospel that he risks life and limb to serve him. And so I wonder if you can see why we've been making such a big deal of gospel partnership in this series, and that I'm not trying to make a mountain out of a molehill. See, for Epaphroditus, gospel partnership wasn't a niche idea or an optional extra in his Christian life. He was so committed to his brothers and sisters that it nearly cost him his own life. And Paul thinks that's the kind of behavior that Christians ought to be awarding with a purple heart. Verse 29, honor such men, he says. And I wonder what you make of that, of that level of commitment to laboring alongside Christian brothers and sisters. Because I'm guessing that quite a few of us will think that it sounds a bit extreme. Possibly a tad unhealthy. And understandably so. Because you see, we live in, in the age of work-life balance. That's an idea that drives much of our approach towards work and towards rest in our culture. And that is a good thing. 
Rest is part of God's good design for people. We're going to see that in our home group studies over the next few weeks, in fact. And so we do have to, to, to approach Epaphroditus through the wider lens of the whole Bible and what we're told about work and life and rest. And yet we do still have to approach Epaphroditus, don't we? We have to do something with him. Is it possible that the pursuit of work-life balance, which can be a really good thing, might it ever become a bit skewed? May to ever persuade us that any kind of cost, that any kind of sacrificial service for Jesus and for his people, that it's always one step too far. Again, at that conference I went to a few weeks ago with, with those other pastors, I chatted to three or four of the other pastors there who independently of each other commented on the difference they felt that COVID has made to our general attitude towards serving one another. Because we were encouraged for a, a couple of years really just to bunker down we had to strip out lots of the extra commitments from our lives, didn't we? And again, some of that decluttering might well have been a good thing. But the question these pastors were asking was, might losing some of that, might it have made us a little bit like, less like Epaphroditus, less willing to ser sacrificially serve our brothers and sisters? But I do wonder if, if cost might not be the only thing that puts us off of, of emulating someone like Epaphroditus. The cost is a big deal, obviously, but I wonder if it's not the only thing. Because I suspect that a lot of us would expect sacrificial service from someone like Paul. He was so committed to telling people about Jesus that he was willing to write this letter from prison. But I mean, Paul was a one-off, wasn't he? He was an apostle, the great apostle. But then we might look to someone like Timothy and again think, well, Timothy was a church planter. Paul says in verses 19 to 24 that, that, that he's a chip off the old block. He's his son in the faith. So yes, there are sort of bold, visionary, missionary types who do pioneer work like that. Of course, they serve in a sacrificial way, but, but that just isn't me, you might be thinking. And yet it isn't Epaphroditus either. All we know of Epaphroditus is that he carried money and supplies. He was a courier. And yet Paul calls him my brother, my fellow worker, and fellow soldier. Can you see that? He is every bit a gospel partner with Paul, this courier. You can almost imagine the scene, can't you? At a gathering of the church in Philippi during the weekly announcements, the service leader is nearing the end. All of our usual midweek activities are running as, as normal this week. Home groups meeting in their various places. Please contact your home group leader to find out where that will be. One other thing to note is that we're looking, someone to take supply, so looking for someone to take supplies to our brother Paul. If you think you might be interested in doing that, please drop our administrator a quick email. I'll go. It is Epaphroditus. Are you, are you sure, Epaphroditus? I mean, we didn't say in the, in the, the announcement because we didn't want to put people off, but Paul's in Rome. He's in prison in Rome. It's a long, long way to go to get there. And remember, you don't, you don't keep all that well, do you, Epaphroditus? Listen, this job's probably best suited for someone else, don't you think? No. No, the job needs done, doesn't it? Paul's my brother. He's my partner in the gospel. Paul's our brother as a church family. And I can do it. So I'm going to go. See, from what we can tell, Epaphroditus isn't a visionary leader going to preach the good news about Jesus to, 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 to hostile masses. He isn't a pioneer church planter shepherding churches through difficult early years. He's someone who loves Jesus, who therefore loves Jesus' people, and he therefore wants to serve them in any way he can, even when that's a personally costly thing. And so the question comes to us, do we do likewise? Do I do likewise? There are countless instances of that happening here, people serving in a quiet but costly way, I was thinking on it this week and thinking of the people who give hours and hours and hours of their time to doing accounts for the church family. 
It might not look that glamorous, but it is sacrificial. People keeping this building functioning so we can meet here week by week, doing practical jobs around the building very, very often. People keeping in touch with our global gospel partners regularly, messaging them to, to, to tell them they're praying for them, encouraging them with messages and emails. People for whom there are plenty of other things they could be doing instead, but who want to serve Jesus, who want to serve his people, and so they crack on and do it, even though it might be costly. See, there are multiple Epaphroditus's in heaven, and we can praise God for that, honor such people where you see them, encourage them. But it is still worth holding the pen portrait of Epaphroditus up to ourselves and reflecting on whether we see his heart in us. Do I genuinely love my fellow believers, my partners in the gospel? Am I willing to put their interests ahead of my own, even if that's a costly thing for me to do? It does come as a real challenge this morning, doesn't it? And if you're here this morning, and perhaps wouldn't describe yourself as a Christian, it may well come as a real surprise. All this talk of, of, of gospel partnership, of, of cost, of being willing to take extreme cost in order to tell people about Jesus and do it together might actually sound a bit unsettling to you. And, and if it does, I can understand why. But it is worth saying, what I'm talking about this morning isn't, isn't my bright idea. This isn't a motivational speech that I've written over the course of this past week. All I'm trying to do is, is teach what the Bible says. And, and even if it does sound a bit extreme, it does all beg the question, doesn't it? What would make these people, what would make Paul and Timothy, and Epaphroditus, and countless other Christians since. What could possibly be good enough, what could be compelling enough to make all of them willing, gladly willing to sacrificially serve other people? Well, we've already seen the answer to that question in Philippians. What would make them willing to do that for their brothers and sisters? is one who had first done it for them. Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. That's why Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus aren't grudging, aren't sort of curmudgeonly about the sacrifices they're making. As you read through the letter, they're full of joy, full of love. They are glad to serve Jesus in this way. Why? Well, because they have been so loved first. Loved all the way to a Roman cross, in fact, where Jesus died to rescue them and to make them into partners in his wonderful gospel good news. And listen, what he did for Paul and for Timothy and Epaphroditus he has done so too for you. He has loved you and served you more than you know. You see, following Jesus, emulating Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus, it is a costly thing, but each of them can see it to be so very much worth it when they know who it is they're following. Now, I still understand why that might be confusing. You might still have questions. If you do, I'd be very glad to chat through them with anyone who does have any questions. Please speak to me once the service is at an end. And for those of us who are Christians, well, let's hear Paul's call this morning. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating Paul and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example of you have in him. Let's ask for his help to do that just now. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you and praise you so very much for Jesus, for his suffering service of us, descending from the glories of heaven into a fallen and broken and sad world, all the way down to a cross. 
Lord, we ask that anyone here who's hearing that news for the very first time would come to embrace it for themselves. And for those of us who have, who've already embraced that news, would you please help us to follow him and to follow those who follow his example, serving one another, even when it's costly, as partners in the gospel. We need your help. We need your Holy Spirit's help. And so we do ask that you would please grant that to us. And we ask that with confidence because we ask in the name of that servant king, Jesus Christ, and for his sake. Amen.